Well, hello, everybody, and welcome back from the latest break. And it's welcome back to me, who was here barely an hour ago. But uh, that's immaterial, because we're here for a different reason now. Um, if there's one thing about OpenSIM that I personally am convinced is his killer app, there are great redeeming features to it, NBCs and all sorts of things that certain platforms don't have. But if there's one killer app around here, it's something called the Hypergrid. Um, it wasn't in the beginning, but for most of the history of Second Life now, we have had the hypergrid, and it enables us to jump from one open simulator to another, jump to servers scattered all over the planet, some of them in the cloud, some of them in server farms, um, some of them on people's home desktops. And the whole world is connected in much the same way as you just jump between web pages. Obviously, you've got to be in a viewer to start hypergridding, but the, the hypergrid is just something that none of the competing platforms, uh, you know, the more modern slick platforms even have. Um, it is unique to OpenSIM. It's not something, you know, that even Linda Navs have. They've got massive land and teleports, but you can't literally jump from a server in one country to another, jump between um, places in different cultures. Um, you can't jump into your friend's computer if you want to, if they're running a, you know, a, um, a local open sim installation. So the hypergrid, I think, really is the killer app um, because the, there is nothing like it. And everybody talks about VR and advanced graphics and everything else. But how many of them have collaboration? How many of them allow you to jump wherever you want to go? You jump from your desktop out around the world in 3D. Um, so it's a perfect system. And um, uh, there's a lot uh, a, a lot going for it in, in very general ways. But um, we, we thought we'd do this panel this year uh, really to, you know, um, get across to many of you who I know come to conferences like this and things, um, you know, just how powerful and fundamental to OpenSIM the hypergrid is, the thing that makes OpenSIM so unique um, and defies his critics, shall I say. Now, to, to actually talk about this, we've got, we've got the whole kind of historical range here. Firstly, uh, joining me again, um, she was on the viewer panel um, a little bit earlier, uh, Krista Lopez, who, of course, created, to all extents and purposes, the Hypergrid. Welcome, Krista. Thank you. And... Um, over in the middle, on my other side, so to speak, um, we have, um, he used to be um, Pathfinder Linden. These days, he's just John Lester or Pathfinder Lester. And um, as well as being uh, fanatically, in, 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 sorry, fanatically, that's the wrong word, isn't it? <laughs> uh, interested in education. Uh, John, John has been a promoter of the hypergrid from the start. <clears throat> and indeed, he used to run um, in uh, earlier years uh, something called the Hypergrid Adventurers Club, where we all sort of got together and sort of, um, you know, met up and then sort of seemingly randomly just jumped somewhere for, to find out what was going on. So welcome, John. Uh, great to be here. And right. I don't mind being called fanatic. It's okay. Yeah, we're all fanatics when it comes. <laughs> we're, we're evangelists, aren't we? I don't like there that word. I don't. I don't like that word either. But you know, <laughs> reality is enthusiast. Enthusiast. Yes, that's the polite word. Right. And um, oddly enough, in recent times, of course, the mantle of the Hypergrid Adventures Club has almost fallen on uh, um, uh, the, the regular Wednesday club outings of the Hypergrid Safari. <laughs> Um, this is slightly more structured in the sense that, you know, there's two or three destinations every week. They're booked in advance. So we kind of know where we're going, or at least the person sitting next to me does. So uh, the, the convener <laughs> of, uh, um, is for the best word, of Hypergrid Safari, and also my co-convener on the HIE conference, which is an uh, international hypergrid conference next week. Uh, please welcome Thursa Amber. Welcome, Thursa. Thanks for having me, Mel. And finally, uh, to to uh, hopefully give us an, um, a kind of uh, an impression of just what kind of a vast um, thing the hypergrid is and its potential, um, we're also we're joined by somebody who runs a region um, on the hypergrid called Eld or Sanctuary. 
uh, basically a sanctuary grid. And um, if you've never been to it, you have to see it to believe it. I mean, it is basically islands after islands filled with these wonderful things we call blam gates. They're just gates to destinations. It's a bit like an airport for the hypergrid, except there's more destinations that would fit in an average airport. <laughs> you know, it's all oh, more planes, should I say. Um, and it's a wonderful place to go. I often use it for, you know, if I can't get to on a direct teleport somewhere, I'll go to Sanctuary, find the gate, and then head on through. And that will work if um, some other connection has failed. So it's really a kind of hub for the whole hypergrid. And, um, you know, um, I mean, I, um, well, I don't know how it's all created. There's a lot of work gone into searching for the uh, links for all these um, jumps and everything else like that. So we'll talk about it you know, in due course. Um, so uh, the owner of Eld and done, doing all that work is Sean Emerald. Welcome, Sean. Thank you, Val. It's good to be here. And and you, you have to blame John for the blam gates. I got the idea from him. <laughs> that's that's that is true. There's there's, oh, there's your, that's your hypergrid legacy, John. The Blamgate. <laughs> <laughs> Who on earth thought of a word like the Blamgate? But never mind. <laughs> they do. Oh, they no, it's a great. It's a great. It's a great <laughs> word. And I remember the way John described it. He said, "You walk up to it and you step through, and blam, you're in another grid." Exactly. And, you know, I, I honestly don't even remember if I came up with that word or if I heard someone else use it. So I'm not going to take credit for it because I can't remember. It's it's a I, I believe I believe it was I, th I believe it was the Batman on the 60s television show. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, then we, maybe blam, we should be blam. lucky that they aren't Biff and Pow Gates. Yeah, exactly. Blam, poof, kapow. <laughs> anyway, anyway, who cares? They work. That's the main thing. Okay, now, um, so as you can probably gather, we've got, you know, we've got the whole history of the hypergrid here. So I thought the best thing for us to do on this panel is really refresh our history of everything, moving from um, uh, the point where it was actually conceived. And, of course, um, this is going to come to Krista. I remember attending um, an event. I forget where it was. I filmed it, but I, I don't have the film anymore. Uh, but it was in Second Life, and uh, Krista um, was demonstrating conceptually what the hypergrid was going to be. And she raised all these sort of platforms and at different angles. You know, this <laughs> is that when there was a lower level, a middle level, an upper level, and they spread it. You know, it was the flat earth, but multiple layers. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I'll try to find that picture. I, th I think I still have that picture somewhere. I bet, you, I bet you do. I mean, you know, but it was a great way of, um, in fact, it was quite unusual at the time, it's even in Second Life, you know, that the, that way of using the prims and the, the flat prims to show the prototype and, the <laughs> and everything else. But, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> too much talking today, obviously. Um, I'd like to ask you, Krista, really, to just uh, give us a little bit of a taste of the history. I mean, what um, what inspired you to work on the code that basically created the hypergrid, and you know how it came about, developed, and how successful you think it's been? And, and right. So, so, so uh, the whole the whole thing the whole thing started uh, back in. Uh, I, I don't remember, 2008 or something, when uh, uh, Linden Lab was uh, working on some form of decentralization. They were working on, there was the architecture working group and there was some interoperability, uh, uh, interoperability work going on. Mm. <clears throat> there was some early work done to, to allow teleports between the very early stages of OpenSIM and Second Life. Uh, and uh, th that was quite exciting in a way, uh, but uh, it, it seemed that uh, that effort inside Linden Lab was sort of sidetracked but for, I don't know what, some business concerns. And uh, <clears throat> it, it seemed that if that was going to happen, it had to happen within uh, OpenSIM. And it, it had to happen, you know, to allow different OpenSIM worlds to connect to each other and interoperate with each other. So that's where I kind of came in and took the, the overall idea of uh, having a decentralized federated architecture for for federated worlds and uh, and try to actually make it happen in OpenSIM. 
So that that's sort of where where it started. So the first version of the hypergrid, I think I had it in uh, 2000 at the end of 2008, I think. It's been a long time. Oh yeah. my god, that's crazy. <laughs> It's How almost, can that even be? It's almost 10 years of hypergrid. That, that, that's so what, crazy. 12, 12 of open sim, 10 of the hypergrid that nearly. It feels like yesterday. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, so it went through several uh, versions. The first version was really a study to see if it was even possible to do it with uh, without changing the viewer. Uh, and I was able to kind of work around the edges of the viewer um, and uh, and then the second version was a little better, a little bit more secure. And then the, third, the third version, which is the one that we are now, uh, is uh, I think it's pretty stable and uh, it's relatively the architecture is relatively secure. And uh, and so yeah, that's what people have been using. And I'm glad that uh, I'm glad that that's sort of what's really enabling people to kind of uh, get into OpenSIM independently and being able to kind of stay together. Well, there, there, there's two things that I think, um, it, you know, we, we talked earlier about your onlook view, of course, which is customizable for people running things. But I, 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 two things that really, over, uh, you know, empowered the hypergrid itself since its inception is, uh, firstly, um, you know, the fact we can now, people can now actually literally run their own um, grid on their desktop as long as they've got a decent enough computer and hypergrid enable it. So instead of going to a world or a grid somewhere, signing up as a resident or anything, you, you, these days you can literally load your own desktop and then it's like clicking on the web page. You just jump to the des uh, destination you want to go to, your inventory comes back to you, you don't have to worry about being a member of a grid that goes out of business. But also, um, okay. Although it, that we have the teleport, the hyperjump thing in the hypergrid, of course, it also really empowers communications tool. There, uh, there are varying degrees of success here, but in theory, you have groups that can talk to each other over the hypergrid. You can certainly message your friends on other grids or we're all within our, um, our consolidated viewer, as it were. So. It represents travel and it represents communication, if you see what I mean. Right. Well, 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 well was that your intention, um, as it were? Obviously, the travel. Yes. Thing. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was the intention. I mean, it's uh, <clears throat> once you kind of have the basics of uh, of identity and of uh, kind of securing identity, and once you have the basics of uh, uh, of uh, Kind of accessing people's inventories, um, then doing any other service, any other feature in sort of this kind of uh, um, virtual world to virtual world manner, like instant messaging or friends or things like that. That's relatively straightforward, but uh, you know that all of that can kind of builds on top of the more foundational of of pres preserving and securing identity and the access to yeah. people's inventory. Sure. Now, the other, before I move on, the other question I'd really like to ask you um, is how integral, um, I think it's really integral, but how integral do you think the suitcase concept in inventory is to the hypergrid? Because I know some grids bypass it, to put it politely. Um, so I don't know. It's not integral. It's a there are many points in the spectrum of of allowing people to access their home inventory or or not. So there's a whole lot of points in the spectrum between not allowing people to access the inventory when they're traveling, to exposing their inventory to everybody. So yeah. th there's many, and in fact, the, in the evolution of the hypergrid, I had th that was one of the the things that varied over time is the, the where where the different kind of implementations of the hypergrid inventory access, but uh, but so it can be made in many different ways, and in fact, the good thing about OpenSIM is that we can we can provide different implementations of these services in a relatively straightforward manner without having to change the core of OpenSIM. So right now, the latest uh, implementation of the hypergrid inventory service that is in, in distributed with the, the core OpenSIM distribution <coughs> is one where there's this concept of a 
suitcase, which is the only folder that people can access when they are traveling outside of their world. Yeah. So what, the, what that means is that that particular folder and everything that's inside is relatively unprotected. It means that when they're visiting a, another world, that that world can do stuff to that particular folder that is out of control of the person. Um, so the, the, you know, if you go visit a malicious uh, world, that 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 world can, you know, copy what you have in that folder. They can add things to that folder. They can do all sorts of things, mm. um, and that and that's why I wanted really to restrict what the parts of the inventory that that is, uh, you know, a random mm. virtual mm. worlds can access. So so that that's that's <clears> where it comes from. But if people if people are using the hypergrid within a collection of virtual worlds for which they have pretty you know good trust among each other by other means because they know each other whatever then those safeguards are not necessary uh, but you know it it really depends on what kinds of uh, of trust people have I so I, it's not very integral. It's it's as I said. It, there's there's many points in the spectrum that can that can happen, and the, the one that is distributed right now is just one. When I'm when I'm talking to people, I tend to try and talk in a layman's language rather than avoid the technology. But I I liken the suitcase to the suitcase you put on the plane when you know if you want the stuff in your regular inventory, it's coming by a shipping container and will take a while. You know, and yeah, I recommend people you know if if they're wearing a costume or something that and they're hypergridding, they put it they put the costume in their suitcase so that. It, goes with them. Is there in any sense in the architecture, is there any real sense that the contents of a suitcase um, travel quicker with you than something you, because um, there are grids where you can sort of get your own inventory, you just got to wait a while for it to load. I don't know where it's the fault of the grid, but is it is the idea that the suitcase, um, you know, the stuff in the suitcase has accelerated delivery while you're traveling? Um, not really. I mean, it, uh, in the end, it's the same kind of traffic that happens uh, that uh, the virtual world that you are visiting has to talk to the home inventory service. It's just a, w it's just a matter of which parts of the inventory service it can access and which parts it can't. But uh, with respect to speed, it, it's not, uh, I, I don't think it makes a difference. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, I like I like that metaphor anyway. You know, I think of it traveling on the plane, and you know, if I'm traveling, I must fill my suitcase and, un <laughs> and, and unpack it when it when I get back, if it's full of houses or something, because yeah. <laughs> they don't fly very well. Right. Okay. Let me move on to the next step of the history, so to speak, and I'm going to move over to Pathfinder, um, John Lester here. Um, as I said, uh, the first, um, it certainly wasn't first experience with the um, hypergrid, but uh, John's uh, Hypergrid Adventurers Club was probably the first kind of formalization of the fact, hey, let's all get together and form a community that jumps all over the place kind of thing. And, um, well, what inspired that, John? I mean, obviously, you're a big um, advocate of the hypergrid, but um, how did the Adventurers Club come around? Um, well, let's, let me see. It started very early on when I was exploring OpenSim. Um, so I had just started, um, I had had a, had a region on uh, Jocadia grid, which was uh, a, uh, an OpenSim grid. And then I was experimenting with um, running my own grid using the sim on a stick. And, um, and really it was, it was, it was um, yeah, the time bandits map. That's right. <laughs> I, I was, I was, I was thinking, you know, when I, I, I remembered when Linen Lab was messing around with trying to figure out how to jump between Second Life and open some grids and those like, early attempts. And I always felt really bummed out that that was something that was just dropped, you know, as, as not a priority for, yeah. uh, for, for further development. And because I, because I always thought that that was really the future was this, interconnectedness because that's really the the future of of i think user generated content is where um it, you, know, it, you have this distributed environment 
right? You know, it's not all everybody's stuff is living on one person's asset server, and and there's no there's decentralization going on. So, um, so as soon as I, you know, as soon as I I learned how the the hypergrid jumping worked, I realized it was pretty arcane. And like uh, James, that loud said in the audience, um, <laughs> Time Band Time Bandits is one of my favorite movies, and yeah, I always thought it was right. so cool of how they would just, you know, jump through these cracks in space-time, you know, from one place to another, and also the fact that it was, it didn't always work well, you know, it's like, <laughs> we, we fell onto the Titanic, or oh, we... Yeah, wrong time, know, we, wrong place. <laughs> yeah, wrong time, wrong place, and it's not convenient, and it doesn't, it's often chaotic, and and that just sort of hit me, I was like, well, that, that'd be cool, you could do the same thing with the hypergrid, you could just have a bunch of people, and, and back then, remember in the early days, you really did need basically like a map of some sort to get to find your way around because you couldn't just jump directly from one place to another. You had to find waypoints. That was the big thing. Yes. Yeah, that? I mean, that's that, 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 that was wonderful <laughs> because, you know, I don't, I, I don't know how many years it was where you're going from lower to middle to top and the, yeah. the jumps and everything. And <laughs> after, yeah. after about so many years, somebody came up with one line of code that fixed it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> and, you know, the... Um, um, the one thing that I have always that I always loved and I continue to love about Open Sim is just this pioneering sense of things and yeah. pioneering pioneering not just in the sense that you are really doing stuff that's kind of out there that'll make most people kind of go huh I don't understand but at the same time also it doesn't always work as intended you know it's like oops you know oh mm. you drove off a cliff oops this didn't work as it intended and. For some reason, I don't know, I think psychologically, it's, it's one thing if you're like trying to do something with word processing or some other, you know, desktop app and it just kind of fails in random weird ways. And that's just frustrating, period. It's not fun at all. But there's something, there's some kind of fun when things go south, when things go bad, when you're with a group of people in a three-dimensional world trying to get from one place to another. Because hilarious things happen, like, you know, like, oh, yeah. my, my hair fell off, or, oh, my shoe is up my butt, you know, <laughs> or I, I'm naked, or, you know, it's, <laughs> so it's just weird things. It's the birth pangs of any virtual world, I think. There's, yeah. Even, even Second Life had them for a long while. Yeah. You know. yeah. So it's like everyone was all in it together, <clears throat> you know, and that was... Mm. And and the early days were just really difficult. I mean, and I can't stress enough how painful it was to be like, how do I get from here to there? We need to find waypoints. And how do you find those grids? And there was nothing like OS, you know, there's nothing like OpenSim World, you know, or anything cataloging all of these grids very well. And and it was just trial and error. And so, you know, just I I still have it on Pathlandia. I have like a map, the hype, the um uh Time Bandits map is over my fireplace because that was really the initial inspiration <laughs> for all of it. I have a and and um, and really, it was just I met such amazing people over time, and um, and um, yeah, I mean, and I think you know where I know Thurzo is going to talk a lot about uh, Hypergrid Safari because I think that's that's not a it's not so much a like you said, a mantle being hand, handed down because I don't want to take any kind of credit like that at all for the Hypergrid Safari. It's really a, a transformational evolution of yeah. into something even, even bigger and better than I ever ever imagined with the Hypergrid Adventurers Club. So it's it's um, um, I'm just I'm just really excited to see it continuing and and growing. And there's even a Hypergrid Safari. I mean, uh, Hypergrid Safari uh, Embassy in Second Life. <laughs> Yes, uh, actually, there's two, but one of them is not official. All the more. Well, exactly. Yeah, I think I think you raise a good point there because um, <clears throat> obviously one is still in touch with certain people on the Linden platform, and um, who really sort of show no interest. Um, some of the tribes will come over to Open Sim and move here, but um, you know, people say, "Well, there's nobody there," and I say, "You, you, you might be mistaken. There is just, you know, there's no map." Um, that you can easily bring up, you know, um, like you can, you know, you can see his where nearby because these are scattered on grids all over the planet and yeah. somewhere, somewhere something's happening. But I do feel, I mean, I bet you guys would agree with me in a second. Um, you know, um, there is that pioneer spirit here, even still. And I, I don't find that in Second Life anymore at all. I mean, it doesn't mean, you know, the people are there for the fun, they can own big houses, you know. Well, the, you know, it's, 
I, I agree, and I, mean, I think, and I think the key thing t- is that to to have that pioneering spirit, your destiny really has to be in your own hands. Oh yeah, and yeah. and and that is, you know, that's not at all what Second Life is about. For whatever it is, what it is, but it's a centralized, corporate owned world um, that has a lot of user generated content. That's really fantastic, but you. You know, beyond the interesting things that you create and the IP rights that you have to what you create, your destiny really isn't in your hands to the, uh, to the, a fraction of how much it is in in OpenSim, where you know I can run my own grid, I can have my own my own uh, you know my my assets are my own. You know, I I, I can back up things with ores, I can um, uh, create content and and you know sell it on things like Kitely Marketplace or or distribute it for free, for free with with no restrictions. Across uh, yeah. millions of, uh, I've had, that's that, that's a uh, brilliant example that I'd be good at work. I mean, although it's a commercial enterprise, the um, the Kitely marketplace, you know, will um, you know is there and it can deliver not to just the grid you're on, or you have to be on Kitely. It can deliver anywhere, and it might be restricted to, you know, not being able to put it in your suitcase and export it anywhere. But nevertheless, the hypergrid allows. You know, it's like Amazon these days, isn't it? You know, you order it somewhere at the one part of the planet, and it comes to your door. Yeah. Um, you know, it's um, it do, You know, it doesn't matter what when you're you're on your own grid or you're part of a residence in somebody else's. It just gets delivered. So, you know. Okay. Um, well, you mentioned Thursday, of course, um, not <laughs> carrying the mantle. <laughs> uh, but, you know, um, something that's changed since then. Um, I'm going to leave Thursday to talk about it. And she, indeed, she's going to be giving a talk tomorrow before we do a hypergrid safari that has been specially constructed for the, for the conference here. Um, <clears throat> But next weekend, uh, we're, we're having an experiment, which is the um, first Hypergrid International Expo. And unlike a conference like this, um, it's going to be uh, four half days. right? But the difference is that each of those half days is going to be in a foreign language because... Of, you know, somebody who speaks only French, for example, or can really only articulate what they're doing in French is probably a better way of saying it. Um, obviously, doesn't really see much point to coming to a convention like this. You know, it's a, it's a primarily an English language audience. And Cesar and I and Safari were looking at all these wonderful things happening out there and, um, you know, thinking, you know, well, there's a space for this. So, um, Cesar, um so tell us about the birth of Safari first, and then maybe move on to uh, um, HIE. Yes. And well, first of all, I'd like to pay, uh, give credit to Krista. Krista, you're a wonderful person, because while it's true, the hyper Thank you. All work, you're genius, because it mostly works. And we, <laughs> <laughs> for 167 weeks, the safari has been going out and crashing other people's regions. And it's wow. all thanks to you. <laughs> Yay. Thank you. That's great. <laughs> really. And the funny thing is there were weeks when it's a um, little bit more difficult. And that sometimes depends upon just the internet. Sometimes it depends upon um, the grid where we're going to it can depend upon so many different things but there never has been a time Krista when I have thought uh, we should just give this up this isn't working, it doesn't work <laughs> it works, it works, it's robust sometimes awesome. it crashes a little bit but it does work and mm-hmm. we've got you to thank for that you've been wonderful to us <laughs> well, that's good to know <laughs> and thanks to the fact that it is fairly um <laughs> reliable that the fact that we can plan ahead and we can organize trips and we can bring 20 sometimes even 30 people to another grid of all different sizes some of them are mini grids some of them are very large grids we've been to every imaginable configuration so far and that's really um it's fun as as mal was saying it's it's really the glue that brings it all together because and no, no virtual world platform will be worth anything without the people who are on the platform. That's what makes it live. The people, the people who are either the, the ones who are creating or the ones who are consuming, the musicians we have, the scripters. It, it all comes together to form a community. 
That's oh, that's really nice to know. I'm I'm I really admire the thing that you do with the Hypergrid Safari. I, I, you've been to my little virtual lab a couple of times. I really enjoyed your visits, and I I really admire that you are doing this every week and you do it consistently. It's really very rewarding for me to know that you do that. I'm glad. I'm glad. Yes. And so, the, how did the safari start? It began, um, as you said, we'll be talking about it tomorrow. But uh, it, it did begin um, very much inspired by what Pathfinder had done. And I could never really grasp what was going on. I used very much a passenger on Pathfinder's trips. <laughs> <laughs> and but it was just fascinating to see how many different people are doing things uh, in in not secret places but it's just so vast and unmappable and i think it's very appealing to anybody who enjoys travel and um, that unknowableness of open sim that sense of um, expansion that you you have when you just hypergrid to different places and it, the fun of going to random places is just exquisite but it's also a great uh, pleasure to me to be able to bring our group to meet the people who made the regions the people who have uh, have something to tell us about the regions because when you hear the backstory to a region or a grid that really brings it to life and enriches the whole um, the whole journey for us and I think also for the grid owners too because it's a chance for them to tell their story which is a very human thing. Very, very true. Um, a little bit, um, I, I know we're going to talk about it more um, but a little, about, uh, a little bit about next week's shindig. Yes, yeah, next, so next week um, we're uh, very, uh, very generously um, Liku uh, Rao of uh, Craft Grid has allowed us uh, a bit of space on his grid to uh, have this um, Hypergrid International Expo and so that will be beginning next Saturday, um, so I think it's in the morning second lifetime so you can see all the information on our website um, which I'll put in here. I, w I would add that if you're around tomorrow at around lunchtime, we, we, we are doing a, a specially contrived hypergrid safari. You'll be going to five destinations. So you, you can choose which order you go to and discover hidden letters. But um, amongst the um, uh, places you'll visit is the actual bill for next week's conference. And indeed, um, Sean's bill, but we'll come to that in a minute. <laughs> um, Okay, in fact, let's 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 move let's move on to Sean at this point because you're going to be hearing a lot more from Tosa during the conference anyway. Um, Sean, um, yes. how does it feel to be managing this huge? I, I can't think of a name for it. You know, it's like a sort of airport for the hypergrid, isn't it? But it's a, visual, a visualization of that famous uh, Time Bandits I, map. I kind of think of it more as the Grand Central Station. Yeah. <laughs> You know, in New York, you walk in there and there's all these gates that you go through that take you to all these other places. Sure. So that's what I've always thought of it as, is Grand Central Station. Um, now, to be fair, mine is only one of several very popular uh, hypergrid hubs, although I think I may have had the biggest one for a long time. Um, but like anything else, competition grows. Um, I think I think one of the main things we one is very conscious of when I come to sanctuary, and probably the only similar thing was uh, Maria's and now Ferd's Hyperica, is that it's dedicated to being just what it is. You know, there are plenty of grids who've got vast hyperports or whatever they want to call them, but you know, you, you've got to be on that grid and look for it and stuff like that. Whereas eld sanctuary i never know which one to call it it's just there you know you're in you've got all these gates to choose from i'm sure you've got to explore the gates a bit unless you've been there before and know where a gate is but it's dedicated to that sole function and uh i i guess maria's uh um um <laughs> hyperica uh was a bit the same but i mean i think that's what makes it stand apart i think the others would agree well my the grid is sanctuary. The region is actually Eld Two. The my original um, uh, landing region was called Eld, 
<clears throat> and that was in the uh, pre-VAR uh, region days. And right. one, once we could have VAR regions and once enough people had upgraded their grids that they could teleport directly to VAR regions, I eventually got rid of the original held region and remade it as L2, which is a 3x3 three three VAR. <clears throat> and that is a lot of hypergates, blam gates, I should say. Yes, it generally <laughs> runs anywhere from about 90 to 120 gates. Whoa. Um, <clears throat> <That's>... Wow. <laughs> uh, it, it could be a lot more if I if I took the time to, to go off and find lots more addresses, but um, I also have a life too. So... <laughs> Well, uh, you know, actually, I must say, I must, uh, I'll tell people on air, though, getting hold of you is a kind of nightmare because you're so busy. But yet, at the same time, I don't know how you do it, but how much work is involved in getting all those Blamgates set up? I mean, the process of setting it up is one thing, but finding the locations and checking them out and stuff. A lot, of the w a lot of the ways that I find them is I go through my logs and I see where visitors come from. And I go, oh, I haven't heard of that place before. And I go and I try and go there. And if I can go there, I make a gate to there. Yeah. There's a lot of, there's a lot of gates there. Well, it, it just seems a phenomenal amount of work for somebody who's actually so busy on other things as well. Um, well really I've, I've automated them to a great degree. Um, as was mentioned earlier, I got the bland gate idea from from uh, Pathfinder, John here. Um, people may remember that there was a time when there were incompatible hypergrid versions and we oh, couldn't go between many. And I was running one version and John uh, on Jocadia was running a different version. So I couldn't actually go there. So I had to create a Jocadia uh, avatar to be able to visit John's region. And I saw that he had this <laughs> blam, blam gate there that was freely available and freely copyable. But there was no way to get it back to my grid. So I had a viewer up in two different windows, and I disassembled his in one window, and in, and in the other window, I recreated it in my grid exactly yeah. the same way. And <laughs> that's how I brought it over, the, the very first wow. wham game. Oh, <laughs> <that's not. laughs> and I did this because people may not remember when Christoph uh, first created it, we didn't have hypergrid uh, usable landmarks. That's so fine. the only way that you could keep track of where you wanted to go is you had to have it written down on paper or in, in, an, in an notepad in your computer. You had to keep track of all these addresses. And I got tired of have doing a, that. You had to have that little crumpled time bandit map, you know, <laughs> yep. <laughs> scribbles in the margins, you know. And I got tired of that. Yeah. So I started setting up a few of these gates and just configuring them to go to each of these places that I found. So that I could easily just walk up to them and, and glance around and go, oh, that's where I want to go and just walk through it and I'd be there. And then I started to get some visitors and they saw it and they talked about it and I got more visitors and I got more visitors. And then I thought, hmm, maybe I should get more places for them to go to. Um, and that's how it started to grow. It, it started as just something for me because we didn't have landmarks and now it's it's just a place for everyone. Um, and oh, to your remark about uh, sometimes you have to, uh, usually you don't have to look for a gate because you've been there before, Mel. Um, mm. Once in a while, I deliberately shuffle them. Yes, I, <laughs> I, I, I like that. people. <laughs> I like people to have to go around and explore the region so that they discover the new gates that I put out. Yeah. Well, that's fun too. Although, yes, I admit it's, um, I, you know, people like me sometimes get a bit annoyed with that. Go, oh, I didn't come here for a hunt. I came here to get drunk. <laughs> well, that, that, not only that, but also when you teleport up from the landing port point up to where the gates are, you always land at a random location. So, yeah, I make it so that you get to discover whatever's new wherever it is you land. Yeah, no, that that's definitely a good idea because you know the the adventure continues and yep. having the latest places up front, you know, it's great. Um, I, I also um, I, I I took Pathfinder's uh, land gates and I improved them over time and I've made copies of them uh, freely available as he did. And now when you go around the uh, the hypergrid, you kind of see the gates all over the place, and that kind of makes me feel good, and it should make John feel good. Um, yeah, 
And I mentioned I, automating it because you said, how do I do it all? Well, it used to be I had to check it every day to see if a gate was up or a gate was down because grids go up and grids go down all the time. And sometimes yeah. they go away. Well, Krista at one point came out with a little teleport booth and it had a very nice feature that I liked. So I asked her if I could use it and she graciously said yes. And so now my gates on their own check to see if it's up or down and disable themselves if it's down so that people can easily tell whether there's a chance they might actually get where they want to go. Awesome. That, 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 that really does help. <laughs> yeah, click it to see if it's online, you know. <clears throat> okay, now, uh, uh, um, I'm not Maria, but I'm just sort of, sort of vaguely curious. Um, uh, stats, basically. Do you have any sense of um, traffic in terms of uh, the sort of places uh, volume people jump to or anything like that? Do you, do you monitor that traffic and have any... Uh, no, any but I have all my logs all the way back to 2011. So if I wanted to, I could do a little log diving and come up with that. But um, I'm a system administrator by trade, but not a big data person. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but so I, the most I can really tell you is that um, I've, I've had about 30,000 visitors since 2009. And I these days, I, I generally get uh, anywhere from 150 to 250 people through the region every month. Well, good track record, for sure. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's always busy, and and it's a lot of fun to keep running. Now, I noticed earlier on, uh, somebody mentioned the chat. I mean, um, obviously, we put a panel like this together. We can't include um, everybody who's doing things for the hypergrid, but there are a lot of other ways you can travel. Um, for Fredericks, for example, is taken over Hyperica. You can um, you can look um, you can look up websites and grids and th uh, sorry, you can go to the website, look up a grid, and click a button. It gives you all the information that these days all you need to do is just copy and paste it into your map and you're away. Uh, there is OpenSim World where you can, um, you know, if you want to be listed, you can get a beacon and you can resist in your, uh, in um, any, uh, one per region. Um, so, you know, obviously a big grid can have loads of them. And um, <clears throat> people um, just um, jump over there. Um, from that, so we aren't the um, we aren't the only, uh, sorry you aren't the only place for doing that. But it's a very good example of um, I think you know the way the hypergrid is going. That all these um, you know different um, services are coming online, and um, I know for example that um, um, a chap called Mike Laurie, who I think is presenting later, he's working on something called a grid phone. And again, um, I, I think this may his his project may actually expand from OpenSIM into Second Life and other platforms. But again, you know these wonderful protocols, as it were, that I guess Christmas <laughs> put there means that you know um, all these tools can be developed, be they on the web back end or in world that like just enhance um, that connectivity. Okay. Um, well, as I say, I I I, I believe that um, we we're approaching wrap up. So I believe that personally that you know um, these days I just say you know well what is it about OpenSim that nothing you know that is special? And I say the hypergrid. That's it. You know, sure you can collaborate, and we have kind of tools that some of the modern programs uh, platforms don't provide, or are very different. And there are a whole lot of unique things about OpenSim. But at the end of the day, we have a we have an app within an app, as it were. The Hypergrid is something that no other platform has anything similar to. You know, this distributed service and being able to jump around and um i think that's what makes it our killer app um right could, actually, actually i've been told we've still got five minutes for real this i wanted time. to add something <laughs> if i could yeah please do yeah we got five um, minutes because some of the, some of the others have talked about what what they think is special about the hypergrid and I mean, OpenSim is really nice for all the reasons that Pathfinder was saying, that you have your own inventory, so you have control over your own IP, your own creations, and, and so on. Nobody in Linden Lab can take that away from you. And that's wonderful, so we can all do that. But we're all alone 
especially if you're doing it, you know, out of your home or something. You're alone. There's nobody yeah. to connect to. There's no sense of community or anything. And for somebody like me who works from home and 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 obviously lives here and I never get out much, um, <laughs> having the hypergrid is really nice because it makes it seem like it's really all just one big grid and we're just running our little pieces of it. And mm. you can hop over to the place next door and visit your friend, like yeah. my good friend Leighton Majorum out there in the, the audience. Um, yeah. it's, it's, it's really nice. You can go to other places, you can socialize with people, you can go to other grids, like uh, going to Bill Blight's there and learn things from him about how to run your own grid better. Um, and there's just, it really brings a sense of community and feeling and belonging where you don't feel like you're just off in a, in a universe all of your own with no one to talk to. Absolutely. I mean, the, yeah, um, you know, that's the answer to people who, you know, say there's nobody there. Well, of course, there's nobody there. Unless you go and find them, you know, and uh, all these tools and answer. that. OK, we do have a couple of minutes left, so I'm going to go around everybody. I mean, is the hypergrid our killer app or um, uh, I, I think you're all going to agree, but just some closing thoughts, what the hypergrid means to you. And I'm going to start again. Um, Thursa, Thursa, why not? I think it, uh, I think it's the community is the is the killer app of OpenSim. The hypergrid makes that possible, but it's the community. It's the fact that we can get along. Everybody, uh, I think Sean said it very well. You can go and visit your friends, and then you can go home. So you, if you want to avoid drama, you can quite easily. You just go home, or you just go to a different yeah. grid. So that's the the it's the community of OpenSim that's the killer app. And the hybrid grid that makes it possible. Uh, even back in the day, I can't agree more. Back in the days of Second Life, I, I, you know, conversely, I didn't want to. I was socialized. I liked it, but quite often, what the thing I loved most was going to a nice landscape that was absolutely empty of people. Where I was on my own, there was no lag, and I could explore and admire it. You know, so it's it's not it's not all about going to a party and dressing up and strapping on an animation for a movie. Krista, you made it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, so I don't think that the hypergrid is the killer app. I think it's uh, oh. it's an interesting. Uh, yeah, I think it's uh, it, it enables. Uh, communication and community just like Thirsa was saying and I and it's a feature that uh, not many platforms not many systems um, provide it's uh, it's usually you know it, it, it's usually not a, a very good business model to have decentralized things when people think about making money out of computing stuff they usually tend to to think about centralizing, controlling things, not not sure. controlling, right? So, but uh, but it so it's definitely a a, a feature that exists in OpenSIM that doesn't exist in any other virtual world platform that I'm aware of, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and so uh, and and that's a good thing that it enables, you know, people to run their own thing and but feeling that they're part of a, of of a bigger community. And I have a feeling that. Um, you know, see, being part of this community for the past 10 years or so, I saw a lot of different stages, a lot of different waves coming and going. So, you you know, Second Life was definitely so important and so dominant in the beginning and people were kind of mimicking, reproducing the model Second Life with OpenSIM. So there's lots of private grids, private, you know, private garden grids. Um, and, uh, and we saw them, many of them kind of, sort of fizzled uh, in and uh, they some of them were very popular for a while and they just uh, got less popular some of them are still around but there's no question that something that kind of persisted through this time was the hypergrid right it kind yes. of started slowly at the time when it started that uh, the, the the private gardens were perhaps more popular because they were more similar to second life and the hypergrid was not so popular but it got slowly but surely that was sort of the, the 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 bind that kind of kept everybody sort of together i think here in in the open scene community and and i think that's a that's definitely something valuable i think so I, I hope that I hope that any other virtual world platform that comes along considers adding a federation architecture 
because I think I, that's very important. Yeah, I mean, one of the reasons I think that they say the kid about too is, you know, you feel somewhere down the road we might be threatened by something like Facebook spaces, which will be so gigantic that, you know, it comes across as federated. But then, of course, it's actually all one big wall garden that you, you know, people will fall into. And hopefully yeah. we're, we're a big alternative, you know, to that, bring the frontier spirit back and, you know, uh, avoid the corporate gardens. But, um, yeah, as they say, grids may come and grids may go. Some of them even go yo-yo. But... Um, <laughs> <laughs> the hypergrid goes on forever. That's a paraphrasing something or other. Right, uh, Pathfinder, any little rap from you? Um, well, I mean, everyone has already said it a lot better than I could. I think the, the you know, what this is, what's the secret sauce here? And, and I mean, and again, it's 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 about the people, and in this case, the people plus the places, and um, and not just the people creating the content, but the people like. Um, uh, like Thursa for you know for creating the the events and the you know the people like Sean who are creating the the waypoints right you know how yeah. to fly around and so it's that I mean and then people like Krista creating the core tech so I mean I think you've got yeah. the the uh, core lineup here and even and the people like you Mal who create the 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 you know the 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 uh, the, the entertainment the shows that you put on. You know, ah, the, the metaverse world stuff too. So I think what you've got, you know, the people you've got sitting here have all are, are all, um, uh, all facets. Pre all previous guests on the show, probably. Yes, yeah, exactly. yeah. But everyone's very different. Facets. Okay, I, so, I'm going to have to be a bit rude because I'm apparently two minutes over time. So I'll just say to Thursa, got two words. Yeah, thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, the only that. thing I want to say is it's all Krista's fault, and thank you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a very good way of putting it, I think. When Krista. Okay, okay folks. Well, uh, You're not Canadian by any chance, because then we could, then it would be better. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, I, ha I have to wrap us, uh, you know, 50 minutes just goes all too fast. You just need to come on my show where we're going for three hours if we have to. <laughs> right. Um, okay. Uh, keep an eye on the uh, festival program, of course. Somebody will come on and tell you about that, I guess. Um, uh, so, so we'll be giving a talk tomorrow uh, in the um, earlier part of the day. And we have a couple of hours of Hypergrid Safari around lunch, with all of which extends this. Plus, um, you can uh, find out all about the Hypergrid on uh, various Espo regions. <laughs> So, um, like, thank everybody for being on the panel. Thank you, Krista. Thank you. Thank you, Thursa. Thank you so much. Thank you, John, Pathfinder. Thank you. And thank you, Sean. Thank you. And uh, that's it for this year, folks. Enjoy the conference. Bye for now.